it was on a Monday morning, on to my usual routine, preparing to go to work. My mother calls me in the morning, and she says, my dear, I'm not feeling well. Can you please organize for a doctor to see me? This was January 2021, COVID era. So during that time, it was hard for patients to go to the hospitals, to go to doctors' rooms. And I happened to know lots of doctors being a doctor, and I could organize a doctor to go and see my mom at home. So she calls me, she says, I really need to see a doctor. Then I said, no, that's okay, mom. Don't worry, I'll organize for someone to come and see you lunchtime. And she says, no, my dear, lunchtime I'll be dead. I'll be gone. I need to see a doctor now. And I said, okay, now this sounds urgent. My mom had never said that to me. She was a diabetic, and she had lived with diabetes for so many years. I think for about um, over 40 years she had been diabetic. So when she said that to me, I panicked. I called my doctor colleague, who I knew was the best at that time. He was dealing with COVID patients, senior doctor, very professional, had been the president of Zima. And I said, look, my mom urgently needs your help. This is urgent. She's actually saying by lunchtime she'll be gone, so we rushed in. Thought it was COVID. We get there, he takes a look at, looks at her. Five minutes is like, no, she's fine. I think everything is okay. Things are under control. Let's run a series of tests. Meanwhile, let me just prescribe some medication, prescribe an antibiotic, something to bring her blood pressure down. And she was fine. And I walked away thinking, oh, wow. Mothers, what a panic. She put me into panic mode. She scared me, but she's actually fine. Took all the tests to the lab. The results would be out in the morning. Passed through Soho as I was going home. We had a chat. We laughed. Went home, slept. 2 a.m., I got a call. Come from my dad. Things are not okay. When I got there, she was quiet. She wasn't responding. Called her, tried to talk to her. And there was nothing. Called my doctor colleague and said, look, this is serious. My mom is not responding. She's not moving. There's nothing. I don't think I see a sign of life. My doctor colleague says, no, call an ambulance. And I did. Ambulance, look, I really need you guys to come over. And they said, unfortunately, doc, we can't come. You have to secure a hospital bed first before we come and pick up your mom. And I said, no, but she's dying. You need to come now. I'm a doctor. By the time you come, I'll have secured the bed. And they said, no, we need you to secure a bed first. I said, okay, no, that's fine. I'm a doctor. I can get a bed. Let's start with Pari and Yatko. I'll get a bed. And they said, no, we need to call Pari and confirm that you've got a bed. Call Trauma Center, Trauma Center, Borodo, Trauma Center, no bed, avenues, no bed. And I said, okay, guys, please just make your way here. By the time you get here and you start to attend to her, I'll have found a bed. And they said, we will not start the ambulance before we have confirmed that your mom has found a hospital bed. I went for 30, 45 minutes, 30, 45 minutes looking for a bed. And eventually I found a bed at the Arundel Hospital. Called them and they said they are on their way. By the time they got there, she was gone. That was that. Who killed my mom? The ambulance? The doctor who failed to realize she was in her final hours? When he walked away, he made it look light. Everything seemed to be okay. And I'm sure we can all relate with such an experience where we've lost a loved one and you're left feeling cheated by the medical system, feeling like somebody didn't do their job right. I still can't help thinking that if the ambulance had come, when I called them to come, should have still been alive. Maybe if the doctor at that time had asked for urgent results, maybe you'd have picked up something that would have saved her life. Maybe you'd have admitted her in the afternoon. Maybe it would have her today. Faulty medical systems, medical errors, overloaded, overburdened medical system. At that time, the hospitals were full, the medical system was laden. But that's not only at that time, even now, we have doctors who are overburdened. You have one cardiothoracic surgeon who's been working the whole morning. He's called for a whole afternoon. He's called for an emergency at night. He has to get out and go. What are the chances he's going to make a medical error?
very high. But here is the quandary. If he doesn't go, the patient dies. If he goes, he has a 5% chance that he's going to make a medical error. Why? Because he's exhausted. We'd like to think that doctors are infallible and that they don't make errors. Why? Because their errors cost lives. But the truth is they are humans like us and they make errors. If a plumber makes an error, the house gets flooded. If a builder makes an error, might have a few cracks in the wall. But if a doctor makes a medical error and misjudgment, people die or end up with serious adverse complications that are debilitating for life. So how do we bridge that gap? It's a very, like the, in, the guy who introduced me spoke said, it's a very sensitive topic. It's things that we don't want to talk about, that we don't want to sit down and have a conversation about. We need to sit down and talk about the medical errors that go wrong, where doctors have actually made errors that have costed lives. Not in a way of vilifying them, but in a way of correcting a medical system that is run by human beings that are bound to A. How do we then come up with the support system for doctors so that they do not miss a diagnosis, they do not give the wrong medication, they do not make an operation, an operational judgment that's inappropriate. How do we back up the medical system? You know, it's interesting. We've got dating apps. We've got sports apps. We've got diet apps. We don't have apps that support doctors where a doctor can go in and up and just do a quick checklist to make sure that they've done everything right. We don't have apps that make sure that our doctors are not exhausted. It's in a microchip that they just scan and say, you know what, doc? Unfortunately, we cannot let you in to see patients. Your stress level is high. You haven't slept in days. They just walk like zombies, not because they are trying to make money, but because they have no choice but to save lives, but in the process, make errors. How do we double check that the script that the doctor has given is correct? But until we sit down and talk about the errors without litigation, we're not going to come up with solutions that save lives. We need the doctors to sit down and open up and say, look, because there are times as doctors where we know we have really messed up. Where, where a patient walks out or you hear that patient is dead and you know you've given the wrong script, immediately you know you've done it wrong, but you yourself cannot talk about it. Maybe you call a best friend and say, look, I killed a patient. I gave the wrong script. I only realized as they walked out that it was the wrong script. Or when I got a call from the hospital that the patient is convulsing, I realized I'd given the wrong medication. Or maybe they failed to check the patient vitals. Just an error. Does that make them a bad doctor? When that one good doctor makes an error, can we not then come up and strategize policies and ways to support this failing medical system so that we do not get other doctors making the same errors? No, rather we want to see them behind bars. We want litigation. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's put things out in the open. Let's strategize. Let's come up with systems. The second thing that we need to do before we even get to the error is to correct the doctor-patient relationship. And that's why I'm here today. From day one, we need an open, honest, balanced doctor-patient relationship where the doctor is not the dominant figure in the equation, where you have the doctor and the patient sitting on the same level. You know, so many times you go to the doctor and they, you tell them your problems and then they nod, they nod, then they write down something and they give you, and you walk out and your family member asks you, so what did the doctor say? They say, come back after one week. Oh, but what did they say? They, they didn't explain what's going on. They didn't explain what they've given to you. And you know what? As patients, you also play the passive role. You get up, you go home, and you come back after one week. The doctors need to sit down and talk to their patients. Explain what they're doing, explain what is going on, explain what they hope to achieve in whatever it is they have decided to do. What is it that I think that you have? Or what is it that I'm suspecting you have? Now, what medication are you giving me and what do I hope it's going to achieve in you? Doctors also need to learn to listen to their patients. Now, as doctors, 
we do things by the book. Patient comes in, take an x-ray, sent for blood tests and everything. I can't help but think my mom actually felt that she was going to die. That she wasn't going to make it and guess what? She did die. As patients, you feel things. You know your body, you know yourself. You've gone to the doctor, they've given you a script, but you feel you're getting worse. Communicate, call the doctor and say, Doctor, I don't feel all right with the medication that you gave me. I feel things are getting worse. But we don't, we keep quiet and we tarry on. As doctors, you need to listen to the patient when the patient tells you how they feel because it's their body, they know themselves better. I won't forget what my lecturer said in varsity. He says, you know what? If your attention is drawn to a certain part of your body, it's because there is a problem. When you are fine and you are healthy, you walk up, you walk down. You walk up, you walk down. The minute you say, my leg, my head, my back, my shoulder, you might not know what's there on the shoulder, but there is something. You go to the doctor not because they've called you, but because you felt something. As a result, it makes you a 50-50 partner in the relationship to your recovery. What are you feeling as the patient? What are you feeling as the loved one for the patient? And when we say patients communicate with the doctor, then we get this patient who comes in. We're not asking you to be unqualified doctors. We're asking you to tell us how you feel. You have a patient who walks in, I'm a dentist, and says, you know what, doctor? I've got an overbite with an overjet, and I think I've got a class two molar relationship. <laughs> and I, I, I would like you to do braces and to put wires and to do the elastics because I'm expecting movement by two inches. No, that's not what we're asking for. We want to know, how do you feel? You put a feeling on me, and I feel I can't chew nicely. The minute you tell me that, I know you have, an, you have a high spot. Slight reduction, and you're good to go. Doc, I really, really didn't sleep tonight. Since the medication you gave me, I've been throwing up. I had one very interesting case. A um, 20-year-old patient that I saw, she was young. She was going to varsity, and she had come for a routine dental checkup. When I did an x-ray for her, just routine dental x-ray, she had impacted wisdom molars. Okay, you've impacted wisdom molars. If you go to varsity, they might give you problems. The mom says, let's have them out. Wonderful. She's 20, she needs to go to theater for it. The mom says, perfect, how soon can you book her? Can we do it today? No, let's book her in for tomorrow. We booked her in for tomorrow. Her x-rays were perfect, her vitals were perfect, did her blood checks, the anesthetist screened her, and she was good to go for theater. We went in for theater, the wisdom teeth came out nicely. I'm done, I'm sitting, the anesthetist is waking up the patient. Five minutes into the anesthetist waking up the patient, she tells me, Doc, I'm losing your patient. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she says, I'm losing the patient, she's going. I put up my head and all the vitals are going down, the machines are red, all the alarms are signing off. I'm a dentist. I couldn't do much but to go and stand there and look. So she tries everything she can and she, the patient is going, the patient is going, the patient is going. At some point she stops and she started to pray for the patient. After prayers, five minutes later, the patient's vitals started coming up. Patient comes out of theater, they're in recovery room. Immediately the patient says to the doctor, just as soon as they've recovered, my chest feels tight. Guess what? We have to go back to theater. Now we need a cardiothoracic surgeon. Why? Because it looks like one of her lungs has been punctured and we need an emergency ope. From disimpaction of teeth to cardiothoracic operation. Call the cardiothoracic surgeon. He's in theater. He's got another patient. Overbent on medical system. He's the only one that we could get at that point. He wraps up things fast. He comes in. We need consent from the mother. We get consent from the mother. The father comes in. She's fine, everything is going on well, the procedure is done, the patient gets out. Has to be admitted for a week. Now I'm talking to the mother and we're trying to get recourse for 
what has just happened. You know what the mother said to me? And this is where it becomes very important for the patient. The mother said to me, you know what, doc? I knew all this was going to happen. To be honest with you, I didn't think my daughter was going to come out alive. The whole of last night, I felt that something was going to go wrong. I felt I was going to lose my daughter. If I could, I'd have made a nice breakfast, but yesterday I made a nice farewell dinner because something told me that something was going to go wrong. Patience feel. You feel. You feel for your loved ones. Communicate. Let us know. Trust me, it will transform medicine. It will transform treatments. When you just say how you feel, we've done the x-ray checks, we've done the tests, everything looks good, but you still don't feel good. You still feel you're going to die. And it would be nice for doctors to actually sit down and listen and put that into consideration. You know, had she told me she felt that something was going to go wrong, I would have gone back on the drawing board with my anesthetist to say, look, we might have a complication. What can we do? What backup can we have? Do we need an extra anesthetist? Do we need this on backup? Can we rerun tests? Had my mom, had we listened to my mom when she told me she felt she was going to die, she wasn't going to make it, maybe would have had admitted in the afternoon. Maybe would have requested for emergency tests. At the end of the day, and this is my take, this should be your takeaway. At the end of the day, in the doctor-patient equation, unfortunately, it's the patient that dies. And because it's the patient that dies, you, the patient, need to make your health your responsibility. You feel an ache in your back. Do you come in after one day, one week, two months? Sometimes you have patients who told you, my problem started in 1999. And you're thinking, 1999? My problem started two months, three months ago. What are the chances if medical error was to step in when someone had a back pain for one day, there's a be someone who's had a back pain for two years and is coming in with chronic back pain after two years. We're coming out of breast cancer month. Did you go for a breast cancer screen? Did you check and examine if there's a lump? If you had a lump that was one centimeter or two centimeters big, even if there was an error or something missed, you've enough time for things to be corrected before we get into something severe before death, before severe disability. But no, we have patients who come in with 20 centimeters, 10 centimeters breast lump. It has metastasized to the liver, to the heart, to the lungs, and it's in the bone marrow. How did we miss it? How did we miss it the first time? You are the patient. You feel, you come to the doctor because you felt something. You've gone to a doctor and they tell you you need this done. And you feel it's not the right treatment. You have every right to go for that second, that third, even that fourth opinion. And come out with the right treatment plan that works out for you. It's time for patients to take care and responsibility of their health. And the biggest question is, how do you feel?